All right, we are starting our lecture tonight. Uh, I'll give a couple minutes for people to get in. I still, I still see the, the numbers of attendees increasing here. So let's wait one or two minutes until everybody's in. Sounds great. All right, I think we can we can go ahead and start. Um, welcome everyone to our Antarctic lecture series. This is presented by the School of Global Environmental Sustainability here at Colorado State University. Uh, before we start, I want to let you know that this lecture is being recorded and it will soon be available at the YouTube channel for the Poudre River Pub Public Libraries. Uh, I also want to ask you all to send your questions during the talk uh, through the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So let's avoid to use the chat. Uh, it's easier to manage the Q&A uh, compared to the chat. So let's use that. And I will read as many questions as possible at the end of, of the lecture tonight. So today we are very excited for having Dr. Matthew Siegfried with us. Matt is an assistant professor at the Department of Geophysics at the Colorado School of Mines. He has a bachelor's uh, and master's degree uh, from the Dartmouth College and a PhD from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography that was in 2015. And all of, all of his degrees are in earth sciences. Earth sciences sorry. Uh, Matt is a glaciologist studying physical process of earth's glaciers and ice sheets. He runs the Mines Glaciology Laboratory at Mines. And there, they are an interesting process at the ice bed interface. Uh, we are talking tens to thousands of meters uh, underneath layers of ice. Uh, Matt is also very committed and involved in science communication to, from elementary, local elementary schools to uh, institutions like the US Department, uh, State Department. And He's very interesting in translate this, his science on, in, on, uh, around local, regional, and global impacts of change at the Earth's pole uh, to those levels. So I'm going to open the floor uh, to Matt. And again, I will ask you to keep sending your uh, questions through the Q&A section uh, during the talk, OK? So Matt, floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm Matt Siegfried, as Andre said, at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, and I'll be talking about uh, this uh, poorly explored uh, part of the, the global water system on Earth. Uh, and that's uh, the, the wet areas beneath the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, and so that's kind of the science side of this talk, kind of the more fun side, in my opinion, is basically a bit of an explanation of how I got uh, myself to live in this kind of small temporary city. It was out in the middle of West Antarctica, about uh, 400 miles from the closest civilization, if you can even call South Pole Station civilization. Um, and there were 45 of us or so who, who lived out here for two or three weeks and, and did some really cool science. Uh, this is all work that's, uh, everything I'll show you is uh, work that's federally funded. So these are your tax dollars at work, um, either by NASA, some of the earlier uh, work I'll talk about is NASA funded. Uh, and then this big project was funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, and I was happy to see, I scrolled the attendee list uh, just as I was getting started. And I'm happy to see uh, one of the drillers from, from the, the work that I was talking about is actually in the room. And so none of this could be done without um, uh, a whole group of, of people who have all different sorts of skills. Uh, Diana also told me that you're a uh, chatty bunch, so I want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So I'm going to try and uh, blow through some of this science um, somewhat quickly so we can get to the fun part of questions. Um, okay, the slide didn't want to go. Let's try this again. There we go. Um, 
So you got a bit of introduction about me. I'm a physical glaciologist. Um, and here's, you know, the typical hero shot you see of a glaciologist in front of a glacier. Uh, There's Russell Glacier in Greenland about two and a half years ago. Uh, and I'm an assistant professor of geophysics at Colorado School of Mines. And, and I use subsurface, surface, airborne, and satellite observations to answer scientific questions that intrigue me. And that's a pretty um, privileged place to be, to basically sit around and, and be like, oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I want to I wanna investigate that for a couple of years. Um, and so you see hero shots like this of glaciologists, and that's really cool. We like taking a lot of credit. But uh, behind any glaciologist, behind any scientist, is this whole host of uh, incredibly smart, incredibly uh, diverse uh, students and researchers who really are doing the bulk of this work. And so I sit up here and, and get to take a lot of credit for the wonderful work we're doing. Uh, but these people that you see in these pictures um, are really the ones behind it all. Um, and I like showing these two types of pictures uh, recently because there's only eight months between, you know, basically being a fully virtual uh, research group in February, all, all the way through, I think this picture was from two weeks ago from our group meeting, where we're socially distanced, but in person. And I, I really like um, reminding myself, you know, we're kind of heading back towards normal in the science world. Uh, but this was a hard 18 months. And, and we always need to remember that at the end of the day, uh, you know, science is not this objective monolith out there by itself. Science is done by humans. Uh, and we don't really know what the impact of the last year and a half, two years will be on how we do science, who is doing science, and the science that uh, we have the privilege of, of getting to think about. And so uh, I hope if you take anything away from this, that that you keep this in the back of your mind as, as we get further and further away from the pandemic, um, how these unexpected impacts might, might crop, out, crop, crop up. The other thing I like to do other than a uh, kind of lengthy intro is, is give you the bottom line up front. Uh, I know people uh, will probably need to leave for the Bachelorette premiere in 20 minutes. I know uh, the Antarctic science world and Bachelorette fans are probably a, a Venn diagram that looks like a circle, right? Um, so I wanted to tell you what I hope you take away from this talk at, at the beginning. So um, if you have to leave, um, you, you get a bit of, of what we were trying to say. Uh, and so the first thing is I hope you take away a little science, which is a little bit about kind of this peculiar and unique aspect of the Earth's hydrosphere. Um, kind of on the how science works side, I hope you get a bit of a better picture of the long arc of Antarctic science. And, and really, I don't think Antarctic, Antarctic science is unique in this aspect. I think a lot of scientific fields have this uh, need for patience and persistence to get any sort of large scale project done to test these key hypotheses that we develop. Uh, and then kind of the last thing is, uh, I hope you get a sense of how exciting discoveries are being made on glaciers and ice sheets every year. We're a relatively new field, kind of modern data rich glaciology. Um, and there is space for tons of people to join um, because we have all of these questions that we are just starting to even develop the question, let alone answer. Uh, and so I hope some of that excitement shines through. To get started, uh, I wanted to take a step back and do a little glaciology 101. Uh, and, and all the way dialing it back to what is a glacier in the first place. And so here's a picture uh, I took and some of the Antarctic scientists in the room uh, might be familiar with this picture. Uh, this is looking out the window of a C-17 as you're deploying from Christchurch, New Zealand down to McMurdo Station. And this is the first big glacier you get to see when you're flying down in North Victoria land. And it is truly awe-inspiring. And, and so what is a glacier at, at its fundamental level? Uh, and there are really two ingredients here. First is that it's ice that's formed through the compression of snow. So we're not talking about, you know, freezing of ocean water, that's sea ice, uh, or freezing of lake water, like we'll get in a couple months here um, in Denver, in the greater Denver area. Uh, it has to be formed from meteoric water, so precipitation from the sky uh, in the form of snow, and then it builds up through time. So you're, you're accumulating more snow than you're melting every year. And it builds up and builds up, and under its own weight, it starts compressing and compressing until it reaches ice. And so that's, all, that's the first ingredient for a glacier. The other ingredient for a glacier is that flows under its own weight. So you don't just have enough snow that it turns into ice, but you, you build up enough of this that it actually starts flowing. It's what we say, it, it's gravitationally unstable. And so um, this is when we make the, the normal molasses al uh, an uh, analogy uh, or honey. So you try and build up a big pile of molasses or honey and it starts flowing out. 
because it doesn't want to stay as a tall, thin sphere. It wants to spread out into kind of a circular disk. Ice is exactly the same. And so um, one of the reasons uh, the glaciers up in the mountains here um, aren't actually glaciers is because they're not flowing anymore. They might be ice, but they're not flowing. So a glacier has to flow, but that's only one way a glacier can move. We, we talk about that internal flowing under its own weight as internal deformation. Um, and that's kind of slow. That's kind of meters per year, tens of meters per year. The way a glacier can really start getting moving uh, quickly is through this process uh, that we call basal slip. That's really a catch-all for a couple different processes that might be going on. But the whole idea is the entire ice column uh, here, I guess I should stop using my hands and start pointing to the slides. The entire ice column is moving over the bed in a uniform manner. And uh, there are different processes at the bed that can be causing this. It could be sliding over a thin film of water. Uh, the bed itself could be deforming and basically moving the ice along with it. Um, but we kind of put that all together in one package, just call it basal slip. And as a physicist or a geophysicist, you know, we're always trying to write an equation for, for how, uh, what controls the rate at which a glacier can move or anything can move. And so we think about the parameters that would go into one of these equations. And so we think about internal deformation. We already started talking this. Uh, ice thickness is going to play, play a big uh, role here, and in particular, gradients in ice thickness. And so if you get a steep gradient in ice thickness, it's going to want to flow faster than a shallow gradient. Uh, ice temperature is another big one. And, and you can imagine back to the honey or molasses analogy, warmer honey is going to flow faster and spread out quicker into a larger disk than cold honey. And those are fundamentally different parameters than um, this process of basal slip. Basal slip, you can start to intuit that, you know, it's this area of the bed that's really going to matter. What does this interface look like? And so it's like bed, things like bed, bed properties. So if it's a granite versus a sediment. Uh, those are going to flow, the ice is going to move very differently over those two types of beds. Uh, bed roughness is a big one because that fundamentally controls the amount of friction at the bed. And you can imagine if there's more friction on a rougher bed, the slip is going to happen slower or less frequently. But really the key ingredient for basal slip is, is water and in particular water pressure. And the, the way that works is if you, if you start to jack up that water pressure right at the ice bed interface, um, you start to just lift the ice a little bit. And so any of that friction from the contact of the, the ice with the roughness of the bed starts to be reduced as the water pressure takes up some of that stress. And so for fast ice flow, water pressure is really the key parameter that we're looking at to understand why it's going fast and how it might change. We can map out the velocity of, of an ice sheet, in this case, Antarctica, because this is the Antarctic lecture series. We've been doing this for about 20 or 30 years now. This is just one picture of ice velocity from um, a paper about 10 years ago. Um, and you, you notice it makes this beautiful pattern of, of flow where we have slow moving ice in the interior. And that's largely governed by internal deformation, this slow process. But just like you know, rivers coming out of the mountains start to coalesce into bigger streams and ultimately end up you know, in a place like the Mississippi River, which can push tons of water out into the ocean, uh, these ice sheets do the exact same thing. And so all of this slow moving ice starts to coalesce. As you can see, it starts to form these green bands. And all of a sudden, that gets funneled into these very narrow features that we call ice streams or outlet glaciers um, that can move surprisingly quickly. We're talking about kilometers per year. You can actually watch these, these ice streams move sometimes. Um, and so to understand how Antarctica might change in the future, we really need to understand these flow features that are pushing most of the ice off continent, which are these ice streams and outlet glaciers. The reason these outlet glaciers exist and are moving so quickly is water at the ice bed interface. And so the key to this whole picture right here is where is the water and, and how is it moving around? This connection between subglacial water and ice velocity, it's not a new question in our world. We've been thinking about this for over 200 years, starting up in the Swiss Alps. The Swiss naturalists would go out and make these fundamental observations, and they started to make this connection between uh, the amount of subglacial water and how quickly the ice would move. Uh, it's not just these small mountain glaciers that we've been thinking about this for a long time. Dr. Henry Rank was one of the early explorers, one of the early European explorers in Greenland. Uh, and he has this wonderful book uh, from the late 19th century called Danish Greenland, It's People and His Products. And I, I love this quote uh, that he has in the appendix of this book. In some cases, perhaps the subglacial streams may, even in, in a slight degree, be considered as lifting the ice as 
so as to facilitate its gliding towards the sea. And the way Dr. Rink actually put this all together was he talked to um, the indigenous native Greenlandic people, and they had built up this knowledge over the previous hundreds of years because the amount of the speed of the ice would impact how many icebergs would uh, calve off into the fjords. And that's where these native Greenlandic folks fished. And so they had to understand the dynamics of the ice sheet in Greenland so they could know where they could fish and when. And so this, to me, is this, this great early example of how uh, indigenous knowledge really um, can put together some really interesting scientific pieces. And, and to be really clear about this, you know, modern science didn't put these pieces together until the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, and so uh, it, it really would behoove us not to forget that, um, you know, the people who have been living in these places that we study uh, really have the best understanding of what's going on. But through all of these observations, um, we can put together images of how subglacial water and velocity work. And, and really, it fundamentally comes down to the fact that with our own eyeballs, we can see it happening. And so up here, we see a picture from Greenland, uh, a beautiful superglacial lake. So there's the surface of Greenland. Uh, and this is a summer melt pond, and these occur every year. And you can measure how much water is in one of these lakes. You can track the flow of this water into the englacial system. So this is a moulin you see in the upper right. A moulin is just a big tunnel that goes from the surface to the bed. Um, and so you can measure how much water is going into one of these moulins. You can walk out to the front of the glacier. So here's a picture I took in a Fox Glacier in New Zealand, where you can actually see a tunnel coming out from beneath the glacier, and you can see the trickle of water coming out. Even in the marine terminating case, you can see um, the plume of sediment that comes out with this water. So the water brings sediments and micronutrients and, and carbon along with it. And so you can see the inputs, you can see the outputs, uh, and you can measure ice velocity and you can start to put together, you know, one of these canonical cartoons of how these systems work. And in these mountain glaciers and Greenlandic systems, really the superglacial system, the water on the surface that's forming through melt um, every summer, is really driving the subglacial system. And so you create this water on the surface, it flows through englacial cracks and fractures and movements, gets down to the subglacial system where it can impact ice velocity. And then it ends up flowing out into the Foreland Basin or into the ocean um, and can have pretty large ecosystem impacts and, and physical system impacts with all of that, the sediment that's depositing and all of the micronutrients like iron. Uh, that are coming out with it so you can drive phytoplankton blooms and things like that. Uh, these are also in places like Iceland. Um, these can be actually geologic uh, geohazards. Uh, so you have yokelups, which are subglacial outburst floods in, in Iceland, and every couple of years they take out uh, part of the highway. Uh, and so we know a lot about these things because we can access them. How does uh, Antarctica compare? Well, here's in the upper right picture of Greenland for you to remember what that looks like with the beautiful green lakes up on the surface. Here's a picture I took looking out the window of a plane in Antarctica and it's much, much, much uh, less boring or more boring, sorry. Uh, I just saw in the Q&A someone uh, is having trouble with the sound. Is that um, happening to other people? I wanna make sure people can hear me. Uh it, it seems to be okay, Matt. I will interact okay. with Jerry here to see if there is anything in his settings that we can we can change. But if anyone else has the same issue, please let us know. Great, thank you. Uh, and so you might say, oh, Matt, this is just a random picture at one time. Maybe you weren't looking at the right time. Uh, I will say this is a fairly warm place in Antarctica. Um, but yeah, so we can use our spaceborne assets instead of you know, this n equals one picture out of an airplane window to map melt duration for a season in Antarctica. And you can see this is a great uh, figure from Luke Trussell, who's a, a faculty member at, at Penn State. Um, you can map you know, how many days per year does it melt. We can do that over multiple years, get rid of in interannual variations. And you can see over most of Antarctica, there's no surface melt. And so we're not getting that large volume of water from the surface into the subglacial system. Any subglacial water is water that's being produced down there through other processes. So you can get heat from the earth, you can get friction from the ice moving over the bed, creating these small droplets of water. Um, and all of these processes are hidden. I mean, this is what the surface looks like. Uh, we can't measure the inputs into the system, which makes it a lot harder to understand. Um, and so we've only been working on these problems for about 50 years now. Um, and the, the first question is kind of, where is the water in the first place in subglacial Antarctica? And, and <laughs> we discovered where water was kind of by accident. 
And so what happened in the post-war years was we got really good at using radar to give you a reminder about what radar is. In, in this case, it's airborne radar. So you fly in your airplane, you're emitting electromagnetic pulses, uh, and you're listening for the return. And so with uh, when you're trying to image ice with radar, ice is this great material for radar because it's it's very transparent to the radar wave. So uh, the radar will, will scatter off the surface and return back to your receive antenna. So you'll see where the ice air interface is, and then it'll be transmitted through the entire ice column and then uh, scatter off the ice bed interface. And so you can measure the ice thickness really effectively with, with radar. And uh, the amount of energy returned from this ice bed interface really depends on the material properties at that interface. And so a granite's gonna look different than sediment, wet sediment's gonna look different than dry sediment. But really one of the things radar is really, really good at identifying is water. Water is like a mirror to radar. And so uh, you, you go from you know, a ice rock interface to an ice water interface and all of a sudden you get orders of magnitude more energy back. And you can actually blow out your radar, radar system if you aren't careful. And so they're flying radar around Antarctica in the 60s. Um, and they're seeing these weird bright spots. And you, they were pretty surprised. I mean, these were occurring beneath 3,000 meters of ice, you know, two miles of ice. All of a sudden, there's a random bright spot at the ice bed interface. And so the um, glaciologists, you know, thought through all the different things it could be and basically came up with this hypothesis that this is a standing water body uh, at the ice bed interface. And then they flew more radar across Antarctica. They saw more of these bright spots. Then they started flying better radars around. And you can start to image these bright spots even better. And then we got kind of get into the modern age of, of airborne geophysics. And you, know, you can tell that this area right here, this really flat, really bright, really consistently bright across the entire um, surface looks very different from the surrounding regions that's rough and dim. Um, and so we can start mapping out what we called subglacial lakes. This is a standing body of water um, beneath an ice sheet. And so we go through our tens of thousands of line kilometers of radar, probably hundreds of thousands at this point, and we can map out where these subglacial lakes are. And so this is kind of the classical perspective of, of subglacial lakes in 2005, and that happens to be the same year I took my first earth science class. So every red dot on this map of Antarctica uh, is a subglacial lake that had been identified in radar. And there were about 150 of them or so in 2005. And they varied in size from tiny little ponds uh, all the way up to Vostok subglacial lake, which is the sixth largest uh, freshwater body on earth um, in terms of volume. So these were huge variability in size, but they all seem to be kind of in the central portion of East Antarctica. When you look at the regions that move quickly, which in this figure are, are white areas, we're not seeing these subglacial lakes. And so you develop this, this conceptual model where these subglacial lakes being identified by radar are these pockets of water kind of in, in mountainous areas where it's just kind of a bedrock hollow and there's local water produced uh, through geothermal heating and friction. And it just, the water just kind of pools there. So you might ask, why do we care about these sorts of features? And as a physical glaciologist that wants to understand fa fast ice flow, I might tell you, I, I don't care that much about them. It's not where I want to research. There are lots of interesting questions about these isolated water bodies. Uh, here's just a cutaway of what one of what Vostok subglacial lake might look like. And if you're a microbiologist, these might be fascinating evolutionary experiments where you know the lake gets cut off from any sort of external input uh, from the atmosphere. And whatever life, microbiological life is in there at the start, it stays there for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Uh, and so there's a really interesting uh, microbiological question and a great analog for, for other planets where we might find life. Um, if you're a paleoclimate scientist, you might be interested in the sediments that collect in these sorts of lakes, because lake sediments tell you a lot about kind of regional geologic processes and how they might change through time. Uh, in the early 70s, there was this uh, other uh, reason uh, people were interested in subglacial lakes, and that's because there had been this proposal to use Antarctica as a radioactive waste dump. So take all the radioactive waste from, you know, the real world, put it on the surface of, of Antarctica, it'll melt itself down through the heat it creates, sit at the ice bed interface, kind of freeze itself in, and all of that radioactive waste would be locked up there, except if there's water that can move around and then contaminate other regions. And so this is actually a quote from the first big subglacial lake paper that was published in Nature in 1973. 
Um, that basically was like, yeah, not a great idea to, to dump your nuclear waste or radioactive waste in Antarctica. So uh, subglacial hydrology really uh, saved us there uh, from contaminating the entire Southern Ocean system. Um, and so that was the state in 2005, just as I was starting as a geoscientist. Then we started to develop newer and better tools to observe Antarctica, and particularly the, the key uh, piece uh, that let us take a step forward was being able to look at the time evolution of, of the continent, of the ice sheet. Uh, and so from 2005 to 2007, there was this kind of fundamental discovery about a different type of lake in, in subglacial Antarctica. And this all came from surface height analysis. And so you have these satellites orbiting the Earth, and they're repeating the same tracks every 35 days. And so you can look at individual points and look at how that point on the surface changes through time in terms of its, its height. And so here's this point L1, and here's a time series of what the height did over, in this case, almost a decade from 1995 to 2004. Um, surface elevation change is on the, the y-axis going from about negative three and a half meters to about two and a half meters. And you can see over the course of about two years from 1996 to 1998, the surface height in this area at L1 fell by about four meters and then it stayed low. And you can look uh, downstream from L1 at, at these two lower points. Uh, and around the same two-year period, the height at these downstream points went up. And if you map out where you expect water flow to go in the subglacial system, these are actually all connected by the same hydraulic flow path. And so you start to develop this hypothesis that maybe, in fact, these surface height changes that we're seeing from satellites correlate to changes in water at the bed. And so in this case, L1, you would have water flowing from L1 downstream to U1, U2, U3. Radar is a pretty coarse uh, tool to, to look at surface height. It has a large footprint, multiple kilometers. Um, then we started to get data from, from orbital laser um, satellites. And so these are using lasers to measure the surface height. And lasers are a lot better because you can get a much smaller footprint. It's much more precise. We're talking about 10 or 15 centimeters uh, precision on this. And so here's an area uh, on the Willens Mercer ice stream in West Antarctica. And it's mapping out all the places we see a funny height anomaly, like we, we saw with the radar in East Antarctica on the last slide. And you can see that these funny height anomalies occur kind of in confined locations. Uh, and there are a lot of them. Uh, so these height ranges go up upwards of nine meters, 10 meters. Um, and you know, in this one area, there's no scale bar on here. Sorry about that. I lost that at some point. But there's about 50 kilometers across, I believe, maybe 100 kilometers. You know, you get about 14 of these little confined surface height anomalies. We zoom into one of them, uh, what has now been called Englehart Subglacial Lake. Uh, and we just look at one track. You can start to see what's going on through time. And so here's this track down the middle of this, what, of this surface height anomaly. We see that the surface height anomaly is, is happening in a surface depression. Uh, and over the course of two years, uh, the, all these transects are happening over five years. So over the first two years of this time series, you see kind of the bottom fallout of this depression. And so the surface height falls by about eight meters. On bottom, you're just seeing the anomaly, so difference from the mean. And you can see that it's, it's really confined. Uh, you go from basically no surface height change all the way to plus or minus you know, four meters and then all back to, to no height change. We can average all the tracks across one of these surface height anomalies uh, and create time series of, of what's going on in or across this entire area through time. And so for this subglacial lake right here, which is about 340 square kilometers, we can map over, you know, over a decade of height changes where the surface falls and then it starts to slowly rebound. And we're interpreting all of this based on these surface height changes as movement of subglacial water, but it's just a hypothesis. We can also map out how these things might be connected based on the ice thickness and the subglacial topography. And you can see that, that we have these chains of lakes. We can have water moving between different um, routing systems. And so we potentially have an ex extremely dynamic interconnected water system beneath these ice streams. Uh, working with the NASA, NASA Visualization Center, this might give you a little better picture of what this hypothesis is. And so we have this upper lake here it's going to flow water out into this lower lake, and it's driving full thickness, uh, full height changes, uh, sorry, full ice thickness changes between the two lakes. We can map these out across Antarctica again, and what you start to see is that these lakes in blue and cyan are actually where ice is flowing quickly. 
And so now these things become really interesting to someone like me. They can move water around so they can, they can collect water for a couple of years and then release it all downstream. So they can change kind of the lubrication structure downstream. And it's happening underneath these ice streams and outlet glaciers that, that I've been talking about. And so these might actually have some sort of impact on ice flow. They're also distributed throughout Antarctica, much more so than, than these radar detected lakes before. And they can be large volumes of water up to five cubic kilometers have been inferred from these surface height anomalies. The problem is then we go talk to the geophysicists and they're like, cool, a, a subglacial water body, let's, let's go image it. And you go and try and image these subglacial water bodies beneath surface height anomalies and they don't look like they're supposed to. They don't look like water anymore. So we have these flat, flat bright reflectors like we've been talking about. Um, these are those classical radar identified lakes. And if you go downstream, these horizontal pink bars are where we expect subglacial water to be from surface height anomalies. And it looks nothing like these clean, flat, bright reflectors. And so we have this kind of um, uncertainty here of whether or not these are actually water features in the first place. Uh, and, and this was an unresolved question for a long time. But if you think that these are, are water features, you can start to build these conceptual models again, where in this case, different from Greenland and mountain glaciers, and you peel the entire ice sheet off to be able to see anything related to water. But you can have these uh, really interesting, really variable water systems where water can take different pathways and, and form different types of lakes. And so where are we in this modern view of uh, variable water systems, dynamic water systems in Antarctica? Do these even matter? Well, I've kind of touched on these on, this on and off. They have the potential to modulate ice flow. Uh, all of this water ends up being um, outflows into the Southern Ocean. And so it's taking that sediment and carbon and micronutrients with it, just like in the mountain glacier case. Because we're taking fresh water and, and putting it into the ocean, it can actually change ocean circ circulation, which can change basal melt rates and, and change kind of large scale ice dynamic um, properties. And again, these can be habitats um, for life. And we can start thinking about uh, habitability questions as a planetary analog, but we always need to dial this back and say, is this even a water signal? And so with that, I'm gonna take you out to Mercer Subglacial Lake, which was um, the, the key target for one of these large NSF uh, direct access projects of a subglacial lake. So this is a lake, lake that is near and dear to my heart. It was a key player in my PhD dissertation, which lasted from 2010 to 2015, um, which I, I note the years because, you know, this lake was discovered in 2007. By 2010, I'm a student working on these kind of fundamental observations of what we have hypothesized is a subglacial lake. And part of my PhD was, was putting a GPS right on top of the lake and seeing, getting a much more precise understanding of how the height surface elevation is changing through time. And so we have this unbelievable um, record of surface height change uh, from this GPS, uh, you know, it was collecting data every 30 seconds. And from this, we can start to develop a, a very specific hypothesis about what we expect to find when we drill into this lake. And so the way we develop one of these hypotheses for subglacial water thickness based on surface elevation is we basically just assume the surface elevation change represents a change in ice thickness and a one-to-one -one ratio. And so we were scheduled to go and access this lake in, in January 2019 or December 2018. So that's the vertical red line here. We can look at the height above low stand, um, which occurred in, in mid-2014. And it was about 12.5 meters um, above low stand when we were planning to access it. Uh, one issue here is the GPS was actually not where we wanted to drill. So the GPS was down here at the star. Um, and we wanted to drill upstream. And so we can just use some simple ratio math to calculate a height change scaling ratio between the two sites. And so we get about 1.2 times as much height change where we want to drill versus where we had data. And so we can basically just go through this simple calculation of 12 and a half meters times this scaling ratio um, and come up with this hypothesis that we expect the water thickness to be at least 15 meters, basically, if these surface height changes represent water uh, column thickness change at this one to one ratio. And so we have this perfect testable hypothesis. Um, and so we go on and test it. Um, I, I, like, <laughs> I like to say that this was a, a pretty foundational moment for me to go test this hypothesis, because if the, <laughs> the hypothesis was wrong, um, my PhD basically was garbage. Uh, but we dragged, you know, a million pounds of equipment out to basically take a hot water drill and bore through the ice and take some foundational measurements of this lake 
how thick is it, water samples, sediment samples. And so here are just some scenes from what this sort of project look, looks like. I mean, this is nothing more than a glorified uh, fire hose shooting hot water into the ice sheet. So we, uh, the drillers did a fantastic job. They're the best hot water drillers on the planet. Um, drilling this hole through, you know, about 1100 meters of ice. And here we stick a camera down. Uh, this is looking up We had a UV collar to eradicate uh, any microbes on the outside of the equipment and down the hole we go. And so the first thing we do when we get down there is measure the water thickness. And we do that by using our eyeballs at first. Uh, and so we look for the ice water interface. So this is the very bed of the ice sheet. Um, and that happened at, you know, 1087 meters depth. And then we keep putting the camera down until it touches the bottom. You know, this is not uh, rocket science here. We just want to calculate how thick this water column is. And so we touch down on the bottom at 1,102 meters and you take the difference. And what do you know it? The water column based on these camera imagery and confirmed by, by other instruments is 15 meters. And so for me, this is, you know, uh, a big, big vindication of, of the work I'd been doing for years before this, where the surface height change from low stand is about the water column thickness in this lake. And so this is a, an incredible hypothesis test uh, that took about 14 years uh, to finally publish. And so I just want to go through this timeline uh, to, to summarize quickly, you know, this is a very simple experiment. Um, you know, from 2005 to 2007, we come up with this hypothesis that there, there are these dynamic subglacial lakes, you know, beneath thousands of meters of ice. Uh, that was going on while I was an undergraduate. I start my PhD working on these lakes. Um, we drill into the first subglacial lake in 2013, and it was totally inconclusive. We drilled it at low stand, so we're not able to confirm or deny this hypothesis. We submit the proposal uh, just as I'm finishing up my PhD. We get the proposal funded a year and a half later. These things take time. Then finally, in late 2018, uh, we access this subglacial lake and measure its depth. And literally simultaneously with that, I start as a faculty member at Mines. So here's my first day as a faculty member at Mines with a Mines alum, Chloe Gustafson. We'll get back to her in a second uh, at the end of this talk. Um, and this is how long it takes to test an extraordinarily simple hypothesis of just is there water? Um, so it's 12 years from, you know, discovery of the lake, creation of the hypothesis, all the way through um, to the you know, doing the science itself. It took two more years to publish. So that's 14 years. That's what, 15% of my entire life, you know, 30% of my entire career. Um, you know, we need to think about these things on an unbelievably long time horizons, you know, almost in a, in a planetary mission sense you know, where the people who actually are proposing planetary missions, they know they're never actually going to look at the data that come from that mission. And this is not far off from that. And so we need to think about kind of generational handoffs. We need to think about, you know, keeping these balls moving forward in terms of infrastructure and, and funding uh, in a very long-term perspective that is much longer than any single one of us. Um, and so, you know, I'm constantly thinking about, you know, how do we set up the next generation to to do better and, and, and more impactful science. And one of the ways is that, you know, we go out and test a hypothesis, but we also create a lot of new hypotheses in the, in the meantime. And so the SALSA project where we drilled into Mercer Subglacial Lake was more than just testing this one hypothesis for my PhD. Uh, and so we took sediment samples, we took water samples, we had like 70 liters of water that we collected. Uh, and I actually installed uh, what I like to term as the first subglacial, long-term subglacial observatory. And so we actually froze in a fiber optic cable uh, in the ice column and it's just dangling in this water uh, column now in the subglacial lake for us to take long-term measurements. So I just want to tell you about three, uh, I think, interesting stories that have come out of this work. Um, and the first one is the story in the sediments. And so uh, we've been poking holes in the sediment beneath Antarctica for about 30 years now, 35 years. Uh, and we've taken dozens and dozens and dozens of cores. And Barclay Cam um, did a lot of this original coring out on the Sipal Coast. So in the same general region that we took these sediment cores for Salsa. Uh, in, two th in 2001, he kind of summarized all of this work, taking dozens of cores, and he said, the, the cores from the ice streams, exactly where we're working, invariably consist of dark gray, wet, very sticky, clay-rich diamictin that shows no grading, bedding, or other structures as seen by any method. And so this is just our scientific way of saying these are incredibly boring cores, just unbelievably boring. It's always the same stuff. Um, and we've done this dozens of times, and everyone knows that if you core on the Sipal Coast, you get this gray muck. That's just what happens. Well, as part of SALSA, 
we found something new. And this was incredibly excited. We found laminated lake sediments. And we had this unbelievably clean contact between the lake sediments and, and you know, the old diamic, that old stuff. Uh, and so that is telling us something fundamental about the, the subglacial system just changing, kind of on a dime here. Um, and lake sediments are great. We use sub subaerial lake sediments. Well, sediment cores from subaerial lakes uh, all the time for paleoclimate studies because you get this beautiful pancake structure of, of sediment deposition where you can just go right back through time like you do in an ice core and understand the regional environmental change. And so this is an unbelievable tool for the subglacial environment. We finally have something to tell us about the history of this region. But we need, we need to ask a question before we can kind of use these laminations quantitatively to investigate the lake, lake history. And that's why do we have these laminations in the first place? In a subaerial environment, you get laminations because you have seasons. So in the summer, you have more carbon being um, deposited in this lake. So you get these nice dark layers. In the winter, you have less carbon. So it's a lighter gray layer. And we call those VARs when they happen annually. And you can go back through time and look at these annual couplets and, and pull out history. Why do we have laminations in the first place? We don't have seasons in subglacial Antarctica. And we thought about this for a long time. Um, I co-led um, a manuscript with Ryan Venturelli that's in review about this. And, and really the, the details of this don't matter, but our proposal is that the reason we get lake sediments here is because of this, these filled drain cycles of, of, of the subglacial lakes. Um, because we've taken dozens of cores not in lakes um, and we don't, get these laminated lake sediments. And so there's something fundamentally different that we're in one of these bigger lakes that happens to be in a chain of lakes. And there are multiple processes that we can imagine that cause this deposition, but fundamentally it's happening because of these fill drain cycles. And so if we assume that these are because of fill drain cycles, we can start to think about how we can use these laminations quantitatively to invest investigate the lake history. Uh, and so here's just uh, a zoom in of this upper uh, lake sediment package, you can see there's def deformation up top, but we can use the brightness signature in CT imagery, which is what this is, um, to look at the cyclicity and try and tie that um, to some sort of time scale so we can get at sedimentation rates. Um, and so what we do is we take these brightness transects, we need to throw out a bunch because of deformation or they're clasts in the way. And so we end up with about 156 traces of these brightness um, records. Brightness in CT scans correlates to grain size. So that's really fundamentally what we're looking at here are grain size differences in the in lake deposition. And then we can use some statistical tools uh, with a lot of simulation. And the details here don't really matter for the purposes um, of just telling you about cool science. But um, we can use some fancy statistical tools to estimate what the most likely sedimentation rate uh, in this lake is. If we have a sedimentation rate, millimeters per year, and we have a sedimentation thickness in millimeters, we can back out when we started depositing in this lake in the first place. So this is, again, fairly simple math. The average lake thickness, 120 millimeters. We have this optimal sedimentation rate of just under 0.7 millimeters per year, which is right in the range of sedimentation rates that you would expect based on paleo uh, studies from elsewhere. And we get to the age of Mercer subglacial lake at about 180 years. And so first of all, that's not that long ago in terms of an ice sheet. And so these are relatively ephemeral features. And so kind of all of this noise that these uh, dynamic lakes are, are causing in the ice sheet system are temporary. And so we get these purges of you know, sediments being released in the Southern Ocean, but it's only happening over a finite period. 180 years ago uh, for glaciologists in this area, uh, is a pretty important period as well, because that's when Cam Ice Stream, which is an ice stream about 150 kilometers away, uh, two ice streams down the line, um, it shut down. It was moving quickly, hundreds of meters per year, and it went down to zero, uh, geologically instantaneously. Um, and so what that's saying is these kind of further field ice dynamic drivers really are fundamentally changing the entire subglacial hydrology system. And so we can connect subglacial lakes and, and dynamics of the subglacial water system back to these large scale ice dynamic processes. And so this is letting us tie together a couple of these processes that we've kind of been thinking of uh, in isolation a little bit 
uh, through the years. And so we can we can start to piece together these histories a lot better about you know how Antarctica changes on decades to to century scales, which are really foundational for kind of projecting out into the future. Uh, two other stories quickly to touch on. Uh, so we have time for questions. Uh, Ryan Venturelli, who's a postdoc at Tulane University, who was my co-first author on that last paper. Um, she's been looking at the carbon cycling beneath um, uh, beneath the ice sheet in, in Mercer subglacial lake and in the larger system itself. Um, you know, subglacial Antarctica has been described as the world's largest wetland and wetlands are hugely productive in terms of car carbon cycling. Uh, yet we don't really understand the basics of how, how carbon is moving through this system. And so Ryan, Ryan is, is really a, an expert in, in radiocarbon dating and geochronology. Uh, and she's able to take these, <laughs> these unbelievably small amounts of carbon, kind of get rid of all the old carbon and only look at the newest carbon. And she can use carbon isotopes to identify where this carbon is coming from. And, and she can show that this is all marine carbon that's being deposited in the subglacial environment. And for marine carbon to get under the grounded ice sheet, well, it means it needed to not be grounded when that was um, deposited. And so the grounding line where the ice sheet starts to float on the ocean had to be 100, 150 kilometers further inland when this carbon was deposited. And you can date the carbon with radiocarbon techniques and, and she can date this carbon to 6,300 years ago. And so in the mid Holocene, 6,300 years ago, the grounding line was 150 kilometers back. West Antarctica was smaller 6,300 years ago. Uh, and then the grounding line had to re-advance after that back to where it is today. And that locked in all of the 6,300 year old carbon. And she worked with microbiologists to then trace out where this carbon is moving through the system, through the water column and the sediments and the pore water. And, and what's really cool about this, uh, using this natural tracer of, of carbon, uh, is she can show that all the microbes in the subglacial system really love eating the 6,300 year old carbon and not the other carbon sources in, in the subglacial system. And so this ice sheet history of where the grounding line has been is really driving the ecosystem processes and the microbial communities um, beneath Antarctica. And so for me, that's kind of mind blowing as a glaciologist who you know, doesn't think about living things all that much in Antarctica, but these, these estimates of where grounding lines are and where they have been in the past and where they're gonna be, are really driving the carbon cycle, which I, I like, it's hard for me to even fathom that as a physical scientist. Uh, the other really interesting story uh, that should launch uh, quite a few new projects uh, is coming from Chloe Gustafson, who's a postdoc at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and soon will start as a faculty member at Penn State. She's also a Minds alum. And she's been investigating a deeper water world. And so there have been hypotheses that there might be groundwater. In addition to this water at the interface that we've been talking about, there might be deeper groundwater reservoirs, but we've never actually gone out and, and seen it. We've never imaged it with our geophysical tools. And so we went out and collected magnetolurk data, which is a geophysical method that's specifically sensitive to, to conductivity contrast. So um, water is basically the con uh, conductive fluid that you would find. Usually these are tools used for finding things like oil and gas, but we're using Antarctica to basically investigate whether there's groundwater. And what she found is there's not just groundwater beneath this ice stream in, in West Antarctica, there's a lot of it, orders of magnitude more than the water at the interface. And not only is there, there a lot of groundwater, it's really salty. It's about the, the saltiness of seawater. And so we can start to develop a new set of hypotheses about this deeper water world that, you know, we think that this is trapped seawater from when that grounding line came back. Uh, it dumped all of the seawater in. Seawater gets locked down there when the ice sheet moves back over. But this is a big long-term reservoir of water. And we have no idea how it impacts the other processes. You know, there's likely a, a deep biosphere that's happened, that's, you know, moving carbon around just like that biosphere right at the subglacial interface. Um, and so we've been working with microbiologists and geologists to try and understand really what the implications of, of these large groundwater re reservoirs beneath ice streams really mean and really might mean for ice dynamics where, you know, this lubrication to ice bed interface is so foundational for um, how ice flows. Can we draw from this deeper reservoir and really change our perspective on, on where the water that is allowing for lubrication is coming from. So just to summarize quickly, um, I wanted to tell you about the, the arc and how long it takes uh, to kind of test these hypotheses in Antarctica. 
Uh, so it was 12 years from this, I think this is a like hypothesis, which was generated from, you know, orbital assets launched by NASA and the European Space Agency, all the way through to, yep, that's a lake based on uh, this large NSF funded project. And by, by testing this hypothesis, we can now say with more confidence that these surface height changes are really providing one of the few windows we have into the basal water systems into, in Antarctica. And so you can think about these as like the pulse of the water system. Uh, that we can track in these individual locations, just like you look for your pulse on your wrist or your neck. Uh, and then in these kind of three vignettes about um, work that, that is ongoing based on other samples we took uh, through the SALSA project, uh, this collaboration between early career researchers in different disciplines is really driving these new exciting hypotheses for the next generation, um, or us, but really it's going to be our students who are going to tackle these hypotheses and, and pitch the next big projects. And so I'm really excited to see where this is going. Um, if you want to see more about what's like living and working uh, as part of the Salsa project, we have uh, a bunch of short, short videos uh, at our website, salsa-antarctica.org. Uh, there are a lot more videos about science that are available on the P PBS Learning Media website. Uh, we did a bunch of collaboration with PBS uh, to create some learning modules. Uh, and then we actually had a feature-length doc documentary uh, premiere last weekend at the Imagine Science Film Festival in New York City. Uh, and all of the uh, movies from that festival are available for on-demand replay for $10 through Friday at levocine.com. And I'm sure you'll be able to see this uh, documentary uh, into the future once it gets off the film festival circuit. Uh, with that, I just want to say thank you. Uh, some contact information here. Uh, and I love showing this picture at the end. Uh, this is what the salsa borehole looked like one year later after that entire town popped up. Entire town leaves. We leave some flags to say, oh, there was a big hole here. Uh, and it just looks like the ice sheet again. The ice sheet uh, erases a lot of what we do out there. Uh, so thank you for, for bearing with me and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Matt. That was, that was fantastic. Very, really fascinating stuff. Um, really nice to see the development of a, of a science hypothesis from the beginning of the way to testing. And also just fascinating for me as a biologist to think about these uh, subglacial lakes as ecosystems where carbon and nitrogen and stuff is flowing. Uh, really, really fascinating story. So um, please uh, send your questions uh, through the Q&A button. Um, I will ask the first question, uh, Matt. So I, I was here thinking about, um, is that too early to say anything since, you know, all these this sub, subglacial lakes are still being discovered and you, you all are studying the fundamentals of, of their existence. Is it too early to make any connection of the change that we are seeing above the ice in terms of climate and, and, and you know, radiation and everything? Uh, how that impacts or will impact these systems at the interface of ice and bed? That's a great question. Um, so subglacial lakes are this, this funny world where, you know, they're, they still don't understand what's going on on the surface. Um, and there are so many questions left about how the, the role of subglacial lakes just within that entire ice sheet system. You can imagine, and, and there is geologic evidence for this, that kind of long-term as we're changing ice slopes because we're thinning at the margins, but still we're pretty thick in the middle, you can start to change the hydropotential gradients around. So how water is gonna flow. Uh, you know, imagine making, you know, the mountains steeper in the front range, you know, lift the mountains up, the water is going to flow out quicker. We're going to drain some of those lakes out. You can do the same thing by adjusting the ice thickness gradients in Antarctica. And so as, you know, the edge thins, but the middle kind of stays stable, we can start to, um, you know, make some of these pockets of water um, drain. Uh, and, and never refill again. And so we actually have uh, one example of this on the Antarctic Peninsula. The Larsen B ice shelf collapsed in 2002, and there was this lake underneath Gra Cla Crane Glacier, which we didn't know about until it drained all of a sudden. And it was this kind of catastrophic subglacial water outburst, um, and then it was done. And we don't know how many scenarios like that exist because we can only see where things are changing we can't see where there's just water kind of stably sitting there. And so it's one of those big, for me, uh, questions, like we really need to map out where water is a lot better uh, everywhere so we can know if we have these pockets of water that are gonna flow out. Um, in terms of 
other kind of indirect uh, impacts. Um, you know, we can get big changes in the water system pretty quickly. And if these are the things that are driving how ice is moving, um, if we randomly, because you know, one glacier thins quicker than the other in a certain warming environment because of what the ocean is doing or a process like that, we can actually totally change where large catchments of water are gonna be funneled. We don't think about those things yet. We have some models that can capture water piracy like that, uh, but not many of them do. <laughs> um, and that's what, those are sort of the, the uh, questions that I work on uh, on another side of my research group where we're, we're thinking about the sensitivity of these water systems. So what can make these water systems change? And will, do we expect those changes moving into the future? Very nice. Yeah, those are very intriguing questions to think about. Uh, so we have a question here from Melissa. How does the dispersion of sample locations affect the accuracy of mapping? Great question. Um, I think about these blind spots we have all the time. You know, we, Antarctica is a, a place one and a half times the size of the continental United States. And, you know, we have a couple hundred people working on Antarctic problems. Um, you know, when I started in this world, we could fit everyone at our, our like big annual meeting, we could fit everyone in one big room. Can't do that anymore. We're growing. But basically, it's like trying to map, you know, the continental United States and understand the processes that are happening by, you know, sending a couple of people to New Orleans, a couple of people to New York and a couple of people to Seattle. Like you're never really going to understand the entire system that way. And so this is something I struggle with a lot. Um, I think we do need to focus on very specific places to be able to you know, make significant process, the progress in, in some of these processes. But we also need to be thinking about where our blind spots are. And, and we don't, uh, like, I, it's really hard to answer this question because it's you know, the unknown unknowns. We, we just don't know. We don't have enough people working on these problems. I could send every single person in this room some data that no one has looked at before. Um, so please help out. Cool, cool. Uh, so Diana Law just dropped a, a question here. She's saying that's great fun participating in this 12 year hypothesis test, testing. Um, she's asking, let me see. I may have missed it, but this water will vary in age for years and then suddenly homogenize and it still be different from another nearby water body. So, so I guess she's asking about this difference in the quality of water from place to place at different scales. Yeah, so this is something we're actually thinking about right now, because uh, we drilled in. We've we've actually accessed two different subglacial lakes um, that were in very. They were nearby. They were, I think, fifty kilometers apart, but in very different settings. And so it's all about the history of the water that's going into each one of these lakes. And so for the Salsa project, Mercer Subglacial Lake, this is largely being fed uh, through a shear margin. I'm getting into the weeds a little bit here, but it's water that's moving quickly. Uh, and so it's being funneled through conduits. It's like a sewer system. And so it's not interacting with the sediments that much. And so it's a much fresher water than the last subglacial lake we were at, you know, again, only 50 kilometers away. Um, the last subglacial lake was in the middle of an ice stream. There was water kind of slowly moving into it. And so it was interacting with the sediments and picking up a lot more uh, salt in, in trained sediment and all of that. Um, and so we can start to think about you know, the different sources of water. But in the end, it's all coming from basal melt. And so this is all, you know, tens of thousands of year old water um, with, you know, kind of all the same sediments at the starting point. And so it is really hard to be able to say, you know, this water is from this lake and this water is from this other lake that's kind of connected to it. Yeah, it, it's all kind of homogenous at some point. Um, right now we have N equals two samples from subglacial lakes. And so uh, we need to drill into a, a few more lakes before we can really start talking about uh, different water bodies and being able to think about this like we would in a subaerial environment. Yeah, what would be, is there an estimation of how many 
how many of these water bars are being drilled? Um, I mean, what from what you have mapped, how many of those you have samples to analyze? I should have mentioned that. So there are over 400 subglacial lakes identified in, in Antarctica, and we've sampled two. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And, and, and back to Diana's point, like these are dynamic systems. And so we've sampled two at very specific points in time. So like we don't even have a time history of how the water chemistry changes through a fill drain cycle, for example. We, we don't know. Is this, you know, when an upstream lake drains into a lake that we're sampling, does that bring, you know, fresher or, or less fresh water into this lake? We don't know. You know, these are snapshots in time of two of 400 lakes. We have a lot of work to do. Right, right. Yeah, that takes the concept of a black box to a different level. As a soil scientist, we used to call the soil the black, you know, the black box that we need to explore. But that's another level now <laughs> of things that we still need to discover about these systems. Yeah, and, and I need to be honest here, like I am not a geochemist, I'm not a microbiologist in, uh, you know, inviting someone like Ryan Venturelli to come talk about, you know, this carbon cycling question and whether we can trace different lakes. Uh, she's the expert in that. Um, or, you know, Alex Michaud to talk about, you know, the surface sediments and pore waters and how water might be moving between uh, the lake and the sediment and, and questions like that. Like, I'm, I'm just a dumb geophysicist. <laughs> Well, maybe for future lectures, we can have one of them uh, coming here and giving us a lecture. Well, it's 7.30, so Matt, I want to thank you again uh, uh, to come here today and give us this great uh, presentation. Really fascinating story, gives us plenty to talk about, and I'm really sure that our attendees are learning much about this subglacial system today. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending today. Uh, as, I, as I said before, the video will be soon posted at the YouTube channel for the uh, Pudri River Library System. Uh, so you can go there and check the, the lecture there, okay? Thank you very much, Matt. If you have any closing words. No, thanks for sticking around and, and feel free to contact me if you have any more questions. All right, thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone.